Looks like we're live. So hello and thank you. I want to say welcome to everybody joining us with us. Uh, we have a special edition here today of our Ask an Expert series with TGH. It's our live Q&A series. Today's episode is going to be on thyroid disease as we culminate Thyroid Awareness Month, which was last month, the month of January. My name is Phil Buck. I'm a public relations specialist here at Tampa General Hospital. I will be your moderator for today's panel discussion, but we are really excited about the panel we have here with us today. We have a team of experts from the Thyroid and Parathyroid Institute here at Tampa General Hospital, Dr. Douglas Politz and Dr. Jose Lopez, and then from the USF College of Medicine's Department of Otolaryngology, we have Dr. Matthew Mifsud and Dr. Christopher Nickel. Thank you to all of you for your time this afternoon. I do wanna say for everybody watching out there, these are some of the most experienced thyroid surgeons in the world. We are very lucky to have them all in one place with us today. And of course, this is a live Q&A session. So you have the opportunity to ask questions of some of the best physicians in their field here today. So please, we encourage you, if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat in here on Facebook Live. Try to keep them as general as possible so that we're not trying to answer any individualized medical questions for you. And uh, of course, we have some questions already teed up that were pre-submitted for people in advance of this conversation. I, I do wanna reiterate, Although we're talking with our medical experts here today, please always consult your primary care provider for individualized medical advice. That's very important here. But in general terms, we have some great minds here today and an opportunity to learn a lot about thyroid disease. So uh, we know it's a general term for a medical condition that keeps your thyroid from making the right amount of hormones. This can affect anybody from birth really to the elderly but in terms of some of the terminology associated with thyroid disease, there are a lot of words out there that maybe, you know, a lot of regular folks like me don't understand. A goiter, a nodule, a cyst, some of the things like this. So I'm wondering, maybe Dr. Politz, do you mind starting with some of those basic terms? Uh, what are they and, and how important are they when it comes to thyroid disease? Thank you, Phil. Happy to be here. Happy to share our, uh, our time with you guys. Yeah, some of these uh, basic terms are th this is a great place to start. So a cyst, a thyroid cyst. Basically, you can have a cyst or best way to say it, a fluid ball, okay, in any part of the body, okay? Thyroid cysts largely are uneventful and, and rarely need anything done about them, okay? A thyroid nodule is a lump in the thyroid gland. It's made up of cells. It's typically solid or at least partially solid and the other part cystic. Um, thyroid nodules are most of the time benign. The majority of them are benign and don't cause any symptoms and don't need anything, don't need any kind of definitive treatment done with them. And even when they are malignant, thankfully, in this area of the of the body, thyroid cancers are the vast majority of them are very curable. They are, you know, treated. They're in a, a uh, clean part of the body outside of a body cavity. And so that's thyroid nodules. We're going to go a lot more into thyroid nodules. So I'm just going to stop the discussion of thyroid nodules there. Then you can go to a goiter. A goiter is basically an enlarged thyroid gland or a thyroid gland that has nodules in it. So a nodular goiter, a lumpy thyroid gland, or one that is in fact bigger than normal. Thyroid cancer, malignancy of the thyroid gland. There are four types of those. Um, mainly broken into papillary, follicular. Those are the vast majority of thyroid cancers. And again, very treatable, curable for the most part um, cancers. And then there's medullary and anaplastic thyroid cancers that are not nearly as common, but those are much more ominous. Those are the ones that are, are more serious and more advanced cancers. Um, there's another couple of terms that are worth everyone knowing, hyperthyroidism or overactivity of the thyroid gland and then hypothyroidism or underactivity of the thyroid gland, too little thyroid hormone. Um, that's a good, probably a good foundation as far as terminology to start with. Nice nice little crash course in thyroid disease. We appreciate that. So so moving on from that, uh, maybe Dr. Mifsud, if you can tell us, you know, it's one thing to determine, you know, how to treat 
the thyroid disease. But first, you have to determine what type of thyroid disease you're actually working with, as, as we just heard from Dr. Foley. So when it comes to using in-office ultrasonography to expedite the, pardon me, speed up the work of some of these thyroid disorders, how, how important is that? And where does that fit into the process for the patient? Yeah, I mean, I mean, for us, I think ultrasound is something that's been usually important. So, I mean, I think everyone knows what ultrasound is. It's what you, when you, uh, your wife is pregnant, you're pregnant, you go in, you look for the baby. And basically it's that same thing, a probe you put on the neck instead of the belly. And the great thing with ultrasound is the thyroid is perfect for the ultrasound. It's right there, right in the front of the neck. You put the probe on, you can see everything. And then you can kind of move it around and look around the neck and really get a good sense of what's going on. So... It's a big part of my own practice. I use ultrasound every day, all the time. And it, it, I think, provides us things that you can't get if you're waiting on a radiologist. First of all, you can see it yourself in real time. Uh, you can see it the first time the patient comes to your office. They come in, you're not really sure what they have. Maybe they've had some stuff done elsewhere. You can repeat all that. It's simple. It's quick. There's no radiation. You can tell them exactly what's going on. The other thing you can really do is do biopsies right then and there in the clinic. So if someone walks in, they don't have, they don't know what's going on, you can tell them right then and there, this is what we have. You do the biopsy and a few days later, you have your, your diagnosis, you know if something's benign or cancer or whatnot. The other thing it allows me as a surgeon to do for those patients who are going to go forward and get surgery, it gives me a plan, right? I can see it there live. I can look to see if there's some other things going on that they're not sure about, if there's maybe a lymph node in the neck they're concerned about, if there's something different about their anatomy that's unique to them. And I can see it with my own two eyes, I'm not relying on anybody. Then sometimes I'll even take that into the operating room with me. I'll, I'll have an ultrasound there, I'll compare what I saw in the clinic and there. And I think it's just an added tool that when you have that ability, it really changes the, the game and lets you give uh, sort of an extra level of care. And I'll actually move things along a lot quicker. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that makes a lot of sense. And then you mentioned the, the actual surgery aspect of this. I think that that's, you know, an important question to address maybe on its own. Uh, Dr. Lopez, I mean, start from the very basics. What is thyroid surgery and when is it necessary? Gotcha. Well, we can talk of thyroid surgery for a long time. And I'm going to obviously, we don't have that long to talk about thyroid surgery. First of all, thanks everybody for coming here, your lunch break or lunch time, spending time with us. We really appreciate that. So thyroid surgery, you know, thyroid surgery can be anything from removal of a little nodule. Um, back in the day when we were not sure what, what the nodule was, we and we did an FNA, a lot of surgeons would just go in and do an excisional biopsy. Today with the advent of NF, you know, FNA and ultrasound, you know, we obviate that. But thyroid surgery is any, anything that you do to, do to the thyroid. So you can, in the operating room, if we are doing a parathyroidectomy, sometimes we do a thyroid biopsy. There's something that we don't like that we were not expecting. We do a thyroid biopsy that technically that is considered surgery. Thyroid surgery can be very advanced as remove all of your thyroid with the lymph nodes that are surrounding the thyroid. And sometimes those lymph nodes can extend to the side of the neck. So those, those lymph nodes can be removed. So thyroid surgery can, like I said, can go from something very small to very big. In general, indications for thyroid surgery, right? And we can talk here for a long time, but sometimes you have a very overactive thyroid. You have Graves' disease, and there are different approaches to it. Some people decide to have radioactive iodine, or they're candidates for radioactive iodine. Some people say, you know, I just want to have an operation, be done with this, and I want to have an operation. Some of those patients that have Graves' disease have oph ophthalmopathy, which their eyes are kind of popping out, bugging out. And you want to remove their thyroid because we know that that you know we can help their eye disease with removal of their thyroid. Some cysts, like Douglas was saying, most cysts are benign, but some cysts just enlarge and you drain them and they come back and you drain them and they come back and the patient says, "I'm tired of getting this cyst drain every three months, every six months, every year. Can we do something about it so we can remove that part of the thyroid?" Um, sometimes nodules that are causing compression, compression symptoms to your voice box, to the nerve that controls the voice box, to your to your trachea, to your breathing tube, to your esophagus, your swallowing tube. So all those nodules can be also addressed through thyroid surgery. And obviously thyroid cancer, right? You have a cancer. Um, the mainstay of, of therapy for cancer today is still surgery. Surgical, surgical resection offers cure for thyroid cancer. Uh, suspicious of thyroid cancer. Like I said, Dr. Dr. Mister was saying, we can do biopsies 
And today we can get a very, you know, a very good understanding of what's happening in the neck. But despite doing biopsies and genetic testing, there are nodules that we say, I don't like it. Um, we biopsy this twice, it's still undetermined, and we need to remove it. So that kind of gives a, a, an overall view of when, a, you know, when we should operate on the surgery, on the neck. And as far as surgeries, there are, you know, multiple ways of doing it. Um, we try to do it minimally invasive as, you know, as, as much as we can, but sometimes the disease itself does not allow that. If you have a, an advanced cancer, more than likely you're going to need a bigger operation or a bigger incision than, than unusual. Very, think, uh, com very, very uh, comprehensive. Great job, Jose. I would, uh, I would throw out something else just to the rest of the panel with this. There's an, another time that I guess we see maybe more than I would have expected uh, at the beginning of my career. And that's patients that want thyroid surgery because they're just, they've had enough of the whole song and dance of everything that was just described of getting a, an ultrasound every so often, getting a needle stuck in their neck every so often, having nodules that this time are a little bit bigger than they were last time. And, or there are multiple nodules that have to keep getting monitored or surveyed. And I'm just, you know, wanted to get some input from the other panel members. Do you guys run into that as well? Because I've, I've been a little bit over the course of my career surprised at how many people say, yes, that was fine for me initially, but now I, I, I'm tired of that. Can we just take out my, my thyroid gland or at least that lobe of my, that half of my thyroid? Yeah, I mean, I, I can jump in. I, I, I completely agree. There's actually been some research here, some of it North America, some of it outside. But the problem with thyroid disease is it can happen to very young people, right? And if you have lumps and bumps in your thyroid when you're 25 years old, and you're being told you need to have an ultrasound of your thyroid every four to five years of your life for 60 plus years, and you need to have an ultrasound every two to three years, that does sort of grind the people. And I think those are important discussions that, um, you know, one thing I think all of us try to do here is really take a patient-centered approach. I mean, there's algorithms, and there are guidelines, and then there's what the patient tells you. And I think there are definitely are patients where I have that agree they really want that on the flip side i have patients that have larger thyroids that you can feel and see that really don't want it the surgery where you know i would really want it but they don't and and we support that too so i do think you have to be able to think a little outside of the box to do this so i completely agree yeah. you bring a really good point about in individualized care right um it is it, like you said we have all these guidelines that we follow etc but at the end of the day we, we listen to those patients saying hey Here's actually what I would like to do. And, and we do listen carefully to what they're asking for. And we try to accommodate that as much as possible uh, from a surgical and medical standpoint. And to all your points, I think patients' needs evolve as they deal with their, uh, with their thyroid disease and, and, and kind of move along in the process. Um, I've had patients come in that, that at first were, were comfortable with the plan and then something changes. The thyroid grows a little bit. They start to notice that it becomes uncomfortable. They have a repeat biopsy that doesn't look quite as reassuring. So it's important to be able to, to stay up to date with your patients and, and guide them through the process uh, as it changes. I think that's been an important, uh, important goal of mine when I'm trying to individualize patient care. Well put. Yeah, this is an excellent conversation so far. I, again, uh, thank you to all of you. And I do want to remind everybody viewing right now, uh, you have four of some of the world's best uh, physicians in this field at your fingertips right now. This is a live Q&A session. So if you have questions for any of our experts, go ahead and put them in the chat on Facebook Live, and we will try to get to those as much as possible. But Dr. Nickel, let's head back to you for just a second here. I mean, when it comes to treating thyroid cancers, how important is a multidisciplinary approach to that treatment? Well, that's a great question. Um, thyroid cancer can be a complex disease. Um, patients often require care from two or three different types of specialists um, when they're coming through uh, our system and when, they, when they're getting the disease treated. Oftentimes treatment for the, for Thyroid cancer starts at the primary care office. Um, it starts with a, a primary care doctor noticing a lump or a bump in the neck and, you know, making that referral to either an endocrinologist or a, uh, a thyroid surgeon, like the, the four of us are. 
Um, when I see a patient with a complex thyroid cancer, I, I think very early on about partnering with our colleagues in the endocrinology space to developing a plan for the patient, again, individualized to that patient's care uh, to, to treat the, the cancer in the most efficient way possible. This really comes into play after surgery. There are options for uh, monitoring for recurrent thyroid cancer and for giving extra medication after treatment with surgery to, to kind of boost the effects of surgery and, and help keep the cancer from coming back. Specifically, our endocrinology colleagues um, are, are able to, to offer radioactive iodine ablation, which is a fantastic modality to, to keeping thyroid cancers at bay. What's, what's most important in, in, in my career that I've noticed is just collaboration with these other specialists. And we're actually able to do that in, in real time at Tampa General and USF. We have a, a, a tumor board that our complex patients can be presented at. Um, and kind of all the specialists that are involved in the care, radiologists, pathologists, the surgeons, the endocrinologists are all available and can kind of put their heads together and come up with the most individualized patient specific plan that's possible. So we're excited to be able to offer stuff like that. I, yeah, I think that that's super important for everybody to, to realize watching here. I mean, it, if you come get treatment from this team, you, you have a team, you know, who's work, all working to try and get you to the best place. Uh, yeah. We did, I, as I mentioned, go ahead, Dr. Foley. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, Dr. Nickel, it's, it's such an important point. And at Tampa General, and especially with our enhanced affiliation with USF, there are, there are multiple, each person, you know, each patient's not gonna necessarily need everything that is available, but each person needs what they need. And we, ha we are able to handle the smaller, very curable cancers. Um, and then we're able to take those patients that have really advanced cancers and need some of those bigger and more involved advanced operations that, for instance, Dr. Mifsud and Dr. Uh, Nickel and their colleagues in the ot otolaryngology department provide, they're able to tackle those as well, all under this really this one umbrella. It's, it's such a, a, a great service to this community that this is all now in this particular field of thyroid cancer. It's all able to be taken care of no matter really what you have, what, what your particular circumstances are. It can be taken care of at Tampa General slash USF. I always like to tell my patients that, you know, when they're getting care here, they're getting multiple second opinions. You know, they're they usually get three or four other people that are looking at it and kind of given the perspective. And yes, we, you know, we work together. So we think in the same way, but you know, we also clash from time to time. And I think that's useful because, you know, it's not just me telling you what you need. It's me and all the other people that I work with on a regular basis. And I think that's really helpful to give that, to keep us all honest there, which is really helpful. I, I love this. Now let, let's start with some of the questions that we've gotten from people in advance of this, so, because we did submit uh, questions in advance and we got some great feedback from viewers who are interested in this topic. We know this is a hot topic just by the number of questions that were submitted in advance. But I mean, let's even start with very basic, you know, Teddy, for instance, Teddy here, he wants to know, how do I know if there's a problem with my thyroid to begin with? Like, how? Where does this even start in terms of somebody who's just getting in at the very beginning and, and just sort of even maybe thinking they feel something different or how do they know and what are the right questions to ask? I don't know. I suppose I didn't uh, target any of you. Feel free to jump in. That's okay. I feel like I've been talking too much. So. <laughs> I, I'll tackle that one. So um, Phil, in general, you know, you're, 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 thyroid it's it's a metabolic it controls your metabolism right essentially think about it as as the heating you know your heater in the house is what's going to make you um control pretty much your cellular metabolism to most basic things and so you can have signs of hyper or hypothyroidism and um and we talk a lot about nodules when you can feel, et cetera. But when you just talk about thyroid disease, right? The most, one of the most common things that happens to people when they have, for example, hypothyroidism is that they feel they're feeling tired. They have no energy. Um, they're, they're sluggish. They start 
gaining weight. So those are the most common things that happen when you're hypothyroid. And that's very easy. You know, you can check your thyroid hormones and figure that out. And the opposite is true. If you're hyperthyroid, your metabolism is up. So you feel agitated, uh, your heart is racing, you start losing weight, and you're wondering, I mean, I'm not on a diet, what's happening here? So those are kind of a very general, generalized view of, of symptoms that of, of hyper or hypo symptoms. And those are usually treated by your primary care doctor or your endocrinologist. They will be able to get some very basic labs and tell if your thyroid is hyper or hypoactive. And it's one of the most, you know, one of the most common things that we see in the United States. Another another thing that uh, we see a lot of is that thyroid lumps and bumps are found by mistake. So a lot of people today get CAT scans, ultrasounds, MRI, and they got a bad neck, they get a CAT scan, they find this lump here. Very common. So I think when that happens, the first thing you have to try you have to do is to not panic because you have to remember most things in the thyroid regardless of how we, you know, what you have are going to be very treatable. It's just a matter of doing it the right way. So when that happens, you get a referral, you find an expert, whether it's an endocrinologist or a thyroid surgeon, then you go through the right path. You get your ultrasound, biopsy if you need to, then you come up with a plan. But trying to rush into something or that's usually not the right plan. The best is to kind of step back, get the right care, go to an expert that, you know, really knows what they're talking about and they'll take good care of you. Because again, most of what you find there, even if it's a really big goiter you didn't know that you have, is something that we can take good care of and do it the right way. Uh, we did get a question just now from Nil in the chat, and it's related to what we're talking about here, so I'm going to bring it up. She's asking, you know, is it worthwhile to get the thyroid checked during an annual physical? Is that something that primary care physicians can handle, or is this something that a specialist needs to handle? I think the very initial screening um, is often something that's brought to the attention of the primary care physician. Something like, I've been feeling lethargic lately, often will trigger, okay, you need to get a, a set of labs, or I feel like I have a lump here in my neck. Do you mind doing you know, an examination of that as part of the routine physical? In which case the primary care physician can feel around in the neck, notice the lump, and then refer the patient appropriately. So. Um, it's, again, all patient-specific, um, but I do think it's within the realm of the, the primary care physicians to do that initial screening. It's just part of the, the annual you know, history and physical and, uh, and figuring ways to get the patient sent out to the, to the appropriate providers. And then the blood testing, you know, there's so many people that will show up at primary care physician's office on annual visits. I'm tired or I'm just not feeling like I have the, the same energy I used to have. And the, it, it's a simple enough thing to add to your testing is some thyroid function tests. Absolutely. Dr. Polis, is, is that something that a patient would have to ask for specifically or a patient would have to maybe advocate for with their primary care physician? For the most part, it is, it's sort of in my mind, it's, it's kind of the second layer of, uh, of the lab testing that's done. The first, the first, group of tests that are done are some very basic ones. CBC and chemistries are, are what most people will think of as their, their kind of catch-all tests that are, that are done on an annual basis from primary care physicians. And then there are some that come after that if, you haven't, if those first ones haven't shed light on anything. And thyroid function tests are usually part of that second tier of testing. And I think also with this, you kind of get into this where there's not quite a guaranteed standard and you kind of have two schools of thought, right? And that first school of thought is you monitor thyroid because you know as people age, it might underfunction. The other group is if, if people are not having problems, why go searching for a problem they didn't know about? So, you know, I think a lot of it depends a little bit on, on you and the family doctor you have and, and kind of knowing where that fits. I think that's also why having that relationship and knowing kind of what their perspective of us, particularly as you get a little bit older and you are seeing them more regularly, is useful because you kind of know what their general philosophy is and, and does it match what you want from someone taking care of you? Because you will get different perspectives there. Right. I think as part of the uh, your annual uh, physical and, and uh, visit, I think it's 35 years old when patients start getting their PSH checked. Um, I'm not a primary care doctor, but I'm pretty sure it's somewhere around there, 35, 40 years old, that your the TSH, TSH kind of become parts of your annual lab panel 
and that's how they you know that obviously that's how they end up picking up a lot of fronts with your thyroid as well all right we have we are getting to the end of our time here i again i want to thank all four of you this has been a great discussion and we do have a couple more minutes i want to ask one other question and this is one that was submitted by laura it's it's an interesting question i don't even know if there is data available to have an answer at this point because it's related to COVID-19. But I did think it's it's interesting and it's an interesting topic that people uh, may be curious about. Laura is asking, can the COVID-19 vaccine unlock the DNA carrier in a person for any thyroid disease or an autoimmune disorder? I, I Again, I don't even know if there's data to substantiate a, an answer on that, but. If anybody has the answer, it would be one of you four. That would be my money. I'm, I'm not aware of any data on that. You'd have to really, you'd have to get all the people that are vaccinated and then get all the people that you have thyroid tests on. I mean, you're, you'd really have to do some digging. Maybe someone's done it, but I'm not aware of it. Yeah. I think a lot of it's anecdotal. If you, the only kind of area where this stuff is really, I think, more prevalent is actually more cancer therapy. So in, in cancer now, the biggest buzz is immunotherapy. And if you think the way I think of immunotherapy, the whole point of it is to turn your immune system to make it go haywire to kill cancer. But when you do that, it also makes all of the other autoimmune conditions you may have also go haywire. But, you know, we haven't, I don't think there's much evidence from the COVID-19 vaccine that says it even works anywhere close to that. A lot of that's very yeah. anecdotal. And I just want to be clear, as far as I know, and, and my colleagues here can, can uh, weigh in as well. There's been no substantive link between the COVID-19 vaccine and thyroid disease. No. There's there's no. nothing that's established that the COVID-19 vaccine in any way affects your thyroid. That's a great, that's a great point, Chris. That, that is correct. Um, and uh, the uh, people were worried about, you know, having autoimmune thyroiditis, seen as your autoimmune thyroiditis that are, as a risk factor for COVID. And uh, the papers have not demonstrated that. You have autoimmune thyroiditis, you're attacking your thyroid, but nothing else. The rest of your immune system is fine. So it's not like it predisposes you to COVID or worse COVID or long COVID or whatever. So um, I'm no molecular biologist, but I think that uh, we, we all feel good about the fact that I don't think the vaccine is probably going to unlock any problems in your thyroid um, as, as we know today. Yeah, well, I, that I was a great answer i mean I, that's uh again i that was for for something that's so new and probably has very little re research peer-reviewed research tied to it I, I think that's a really solid answer from all of you so thank you very much we are coming up towards the end of our allotted time but this has been a fantastic discussion i want to thank all four of you dr lopez dr polites dr mifsud and dr nickel uh, again uh, this is uh, what an opportunity to have a half hour with four world-class experts in their field. We cannot thank you enough for your time and for taking the time to answer some of these questions from some of our viewers. I, I do want to remind our viewers here, if you want to visit the links at the bottom of the screen, uh, you can explore all sorts of more information about thyroid at Tampa General Hospital and at USF Health. Uh, you To receive the latest updates on COVID-19, you can also go to the TGH Coronavirus Hub at www tgh.org backslash COVID. Again, thank you everyone for taking some time out of your day to participate in this conversation. And we look forward to seeing all of you back here for our next edition of Ask an Expert with TGH, part of our live Q&A series right here on Facebook Live. Doctors, thank you so much for your time and everybody out there, have a great rest of your day. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks everybody.